Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission show. We want to narrate your scariest work stories, so send them to us at darkstories.org. And if you want to support us, go to eeriecast.com to follow our other scary shows and shop our store. We've got a really cool Wendigo coffee mug that's surprisingly popular with the non-Wendigo crowd. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Road rage is a heck of a beast. If I see one more person going 40 in a 75, I'm gonna... Well, I should probably just sigh and turn on cruise control. It's just so infuriating when you're just trying to get to work or get back home and folks on the road drive like mushrooms. Good luck figuring out what that even means. Well, I'm about to head out for my break. So you and I can chat about some new scary work stories. I've got just the one today about a night drive home that turned into a living nightmare for one poor grocery store employee. Enjoy. These are tales from the break room. The Drive Home From Miss Travel Tess I've contemplated telling this story a lot lately. I'm older, and my children are now starting to drive. So it's not to be unexpected that this memory would be at the forefront of my mind now. When I was 16, I was way off track in my short life. I had dropped out of school and had no future ahead of me. I decided I needed a job. Well, my parents helped decide for me. Coming from an abusive home, it only stands to reason that my money-hungry parents would expect a 16-year-old to pay rent and utilities. So that's what I did. I got my GED and went off to find a job. The place that hired me on was a mom-and-pop store. I was working as a bagger. Yes, I had the apron and helped customers take their groceries to their cars, and I pushed carts up a long hill by the dozen every hour. Back then, that was a perfect starting place for someone who had never worked before. The pay was terrible, the hours were long, and the customers were often awful. If I wasn't being stalked by customers or assaulted, it just wasn't a regular day. I was immediately put on the third shift. This was the busiest part of the day, until it wasn't, since the store would close at 10 p.m. I was usually left alone to sweep and mop the floors then. After that, I would take out all the trash and bring in all the carts, followed by cleaning the bathrooms. The women's bathroom wasn't so bad but the men's bathroom was usually wall-to-wall -wall feces and trash and left me feeling like I needed a bleach bath every night. This event is still fresh in my mind as the day it happened. My supervisor came by and congratulated me on six months of hard work and handed me an envelope. Inside it was my paycheck and another check, a bonus of $20. At the time, I was just relieved to have enough money to get by so I tucked that envelope in my apron and went on with my day. By the end of my shift, I was exhausted, ready for the drive home. My drive home was usually 30 minutes up hills and into the mountains. At some points, there was nothing but empty highways. There were no street lights and very few homes. We lived in the middle of nowhere, and it was desolate. At 12 a.m., it was spooky and lonesome, but nothing to fear, or so I thought. I would stop at the last and only 24-hour gas station in town, fill up on gas, and head down the road. Usually, I'd play music loudly to keep myself awake, though sometimes the FM stations would fade in and out as my truck climbed the hills. My truck was old and the headlights barely showed the road in front of me, but it got me from point A to point B, I tapped my fingers on the steering wheel as the music came back, blasting loudly as if I'd maxed out the volume. Startled, I quickly grabbed the dial and lowered the music. I shook my head. Suddenly, I saw something. In the rearview mirror in the distance, bright headlights, and they were coming up on me very fast. Not unusual to have a straggler here and there, as there were a lot of bonfire drunken parties out in the boonies. But they came up on me and without hesitation, they bumped right into my truck. 
I was driving 65 miles per hour, and my truck lurched and rattled, barely staying on the road. The scream that came from my throat was of pure terror. I didn't understand, were they drunk? What did I do? I didn't want to die, not in the middle of nowhere, with this car chasing me down. It was the late 90s. Cell phones were still pretty new, but there was no service in our area, not to mention most of them were unaffordable for a 16-year-old bagger. So I was completely and utterly alone in the middle of nowhere. I sped up, begging my truck to go as they came up again, hitting my bumper even harder. My truck swerved all over the road, catching gravel at some point. It flew up hitting the windshield as I returned to the road. I knew my truck could not take much more. The car swerved around me and was now driving in the left lane. Its engine roared as it passed by. It was a 1970s style Cadillac, a green color. As it passed by, I looked. I could not see the driver or passenger through the windows. As they got ahead of me and pulled into the right lane, I could make out two figures with my dim and useless headlights. They then started braking hard, which in turn caused me to brake and swerve. This went on for what felt like an eternity before they finally sped up and disappeared over a hill. There was a brief pause, a moment where I thought maybe they were done, bored, and had taken off. As I came up over the hill, in the halo of my dim headlights, was the car, now parked in the middle of the road across both lanes. I screamed again as the car doors flew open. I couldn't see anyone inside, just doors flying open. I was confused, bewildered, scared. I only had seconds to act, and instead of braking, I went off the road, barely missing a mile marker as I flew by them. I hit the brush on the side of the road, hard, small branches breaking against my windshield as I drove. I soon found a break between the mile markers as I gunned the engine. I felt the truck lift off the ground for a brief moment, and I hit pavement, sparks flying as I corrected the truck and drove with the gas pedal down to the floor. Screaming and crying, I pushed that old truck as fast as it could go, and the moment I saw my turn towards home, I swerved and hit the dirt road. I sped all the way home, turning my headlights off as I knew the roads like the back of my hand. The headlights were behind me, looking for me. I rolled into my driveway and shut off the engine, rolling behind a line of trees. In the pitch black, I double-checked the locks on the doors, and I lay down in the seat. I looked at my front door, knowing how many steps it was, and wondering if I'd be fast enough to make it inside. I soon saw headlights, and I held my breath, trying to control my sobbing. I knew that I was hidden behind this line of trees, but in my mind, I just knew they were going to find me. As the car rolled by, I ducked my head down and put my hand over my mouth, resisting the urge to scream in fear. The taillights hit up the night as the car rolled by and continued on. I waited, shaking and sobbing, fearful they would come back. I lay in the seat, not moving for what seemed like forever. Eventually, I sat up slowly. I looked around and decided to run for it. I unlocked the door and took off running. I stumbled and grabbed the railing of the stairs, climbing to the door. I jammed my key into the lock and I swung the door open, jumping inside quickly and locking the door as I cried. Of course, my parents insisted I was making this all up. Then they also wanted me to go to the police which the police couldn't do much. The only proof I had was the damage to the truck, which they said could possibly just be my fault. I went back to work because I had no choice. I was terrified, looking at all the cars around me for months. To this day, I still wonder if they were after my paycheck. How long had they been watching me? What would have happened if I had stopped instead of swerving around their car? Why didn't I see anyone inside when those doors flew open? Where were the people? I'll never know for sure. 
Gremlin from Big Bad. I was 15 when this happened, so excuse any dumb decision making that takes place. I was working age and it was spring break, so my dad decided to have me work at his wholesale warehouse. We sold hydraulic tubes and fittings and whatnot. All the different sizes and materials and formats had to be carefully organized and audited. Since I was the youngest on the crew, and my coworkers were too busy keeping track of items and accepting shipments, I was on dusting duty. It wasn't an attractive job for a kid like me, knowing my friends might see me covered in black soot and grease, but my dad was practically spoiling me with the pay. I remember the first odd thing I noticed was on my first day. I was on a rickety stool to reach the top of one of the more remote shelves in the warehouse. No one had bothered to clean it for who knows how long. Probably why they were so eager to have me be Cinderella. I hated that nickname. I was trying to keep my balance on essentially a block of plywood, while trying to not get grime in my eyes. My little surgical mask only protected my nose and mouth. That's when I noticed a pattern in the dust before I cleaned it off. Handprints. Two bare handprints like a person's were diagonal from one another in the dust. They were facing me, away from the shelf, so it would be very hard for one of the guys to have made it without climbing on the precarious 10-foot shelf and possibly toppling hundreds of dollars worth of industrial goods. I was weirded out at first, but I dismissed it as maybe a big raccoon or the guys pulling a prank on Cinderella. Fast forward to my fourth day. I was settling in and the hazing from the group stopped as we hung out more. That day just before closing time, we heard one of the managers cursing in the warehouse. It was Michael, a middle-aged Lakota man who was usually very chill and helpful. He was the only one to never call me Cinderella, actually. My father and I ran down one of the vast aisles to find him covering his nose and trying to open a garbage bag. Someone took a crap, he flatly said. Alas, on the ground before us was a steamy little bundle of joy. It had to be a someone, too. We have a dog named Monkey who goes to work with us. He's a Weimaraner and on the smaller side of the breed. Even though we doubted it, my dad blamed Monkey and helped Michael clean it up. Thankfully, I was left out on that adventure. I suspected that the phantom dumper was related to the handprints I'd found. My dad checked our CCTV to no avail, just in case. We have quite the homeless population around here. It would make sense if someone stayed the night somehow, despite the multitude of padlocks I was instructed to check before closing every day. The very next day, and my last, would be what dissolved that theory. I should clarify the structure of the warehouse. There's the main office, a brick building that is much older than the rest of the place. It has offices, a break room, and a service counter. Its roof was maybe 10 or 11 feet. Now, the main warehouse was a metal rectangle that overlapped with the break room. It was at least twice the size of the office, and maybe three feet taller. Well, that creates a little crawl space that's about half the width and length of the main office, and three feet tall. You could access it with a ladder. Some junk like styrofoam and insulation was wadded up in there for no good reason. Cut to the fifth day. As I was cleaning up the aisles near the crawl space, the lighting there is dim, so I have a flashlight with me in case a bulb goes out, or to verify the cleanliness of a shelf. I began to hear a rustling sound and the ping of something metallic coming from the crawl space above me. I froze before looking up at the gaping darkness. Pink insulation around its edges made it seem like the mouth of some cotton candy cave. I think of the crap and the handprints knowing that something at least like a raccoon was up there. Despite knowing this, I grabbed my stool and I peered into the crawl space with my light. With stalagmites of wet cardboard and other debris casting long shadows, I saw it. 
It looked like a man, but its skin caught the light, suggesting the faintest layer of fur or hair. Besides that, it seemed nude, a pot belly hanging down from its quadrupedal position. Its face, Christ, was wrinkly like a bloodhound. Bloodhound skin wrapped around the features of a human and eye shine reflecting my flashlight back. I screamed like a little girl then, falling from the stool in the process. The creature screamed back as deep as a grown man. The sound of it scurrying away across metal faded. Michael and the guy he had been instructing ran over to find me in a sweat, pointing at the crawl space. There's something in there, a person or animal. All right, all right, we'll call the cops. Go tell Bill, my dad. The cops came and checked the roof, finding a slit in the metal connecting to the crawl space. The edges of it were covered in little slashes like tiny claw marks. They searched the crawl space, and besides urine-soaked insulation and some footprints, they never found that thing. I don't think what I saw was human. Sure, deformities and disease might explain some of those odd features, but the eyes, our eyes, don't shine like that of a dog or deer. I've come to call that thing a gremlin. No relation to the movie, but because it dwelled in a sort of industrial setting. Somewhere I read that British pilots in World War II blamed tech problems on gremlins as a sort of joke. Whatever it was, I never saw it again. It certainly made my first job a lot more memorable. Two shelters, two different haunts, one annoyed advocate. From Anonymous. Since I was a little kid, my mom has been working at a domestic violence program. So while growing up, I helped out in the different shelters, cleaning the playroom, aka making a bigger mess than when I found it. There are two shelters I particularly remember growing up around. A huge, beautiful old building that was built back in the 1890s, and an old school slash nunnery that has since been repurposed into our shelter. Even when I was younger, I heard whispers of ghost stories and strange encounters that the staff and clients would tell. I even remember playing with a little boy who talked about seeing a tall black shadow which walked down the hall and into one of the rooms in the nunnery. So that's where I began the tale of the old nunnery. When I grew up, I swore up and down that I would not get into the domestic violence field. I even went to college to be a microbiologist. But life has a different plan sometimes. After several sharp turns, I ended up getting a social work degree, and I worked at the shelters. I was an overnight advocate for about four years, which is when these stories started and my own experiences came to light. During the first few months that I started working there, I had a client come down. They were visibly shaken, and I asked what happened. Thinking at this point I might have to call 911 if an abuser showed up, I quickly glanced at the cameras and saw that there was nothing outside but a cold winter night. The client cleared their throat and spoke, and what came next chilled me to my bones. I, I think I saw something, but I'm not sure what to do. The client spoke in a shaky voice. I patted the seat next to the office desk I was working at. She sat down while I asked, What do you mean you saw something? Do you mean like a bug or someone outside? They sat in quiet for what seemed like hours. Their face scrunched up like they were trying to put what they saw into words but could not come up with the right combination. Finally, they said something. I... I thought I saw someone walk into my kid's room, but when I went into the room to confront them, there was no one there. What do you mean? Someone went into their room? I racked my brain on who all might be in the shelter at this time, but at the time, all the other clients had night jobs so it was just me and their family in the shelter. It was someone tall in a black robe. 
I had just come out of the kitchen and I saw them walking. Well, I guess not really walking, but gliding down the hall. I saw the door open and close. I know I must sound crazy, but I swear to you, I saw a white hand reach out and open the door, then close the door behind them. Okay, grab your kids and go back into your room. The alarm is on, and the only way in and out of this shelter is through the door by our office. So if anyone is here, we will see them, or they'll trip the alarm. I grabbed the hotline and dialed 911 so that the police could come clear the house. Once the officers left, though, investigating the property, they stated that there were no signs of a break-in. I even rewound our surveillance footage, and I found nothing, minus the clients coming and leaving from shelter and a stray dog which had wandered through our front yard. With a sigh of relief, I settled in for the rest of my shift. The next couple of months were quiet. New clients came and went, so there was a new crop of people in the program. During this time, I talked to my fellow co-workers. They told me about how they heard things move around upstairs while no one was in the shelter, but nothing like what the client had talked about. So I did what any good Catholic was taught. Ignore the crap out of the spirits until they go away. However, although I did ignore them, they did not ignore me. After the start of the new year, my co-worker and I were doing shift change. At our shelter, evenings and overnights, only one person works at a time. How our office is set up is that there is the advocate's office which connects to a conference room, which then leads to the laundry area where there is a door to exit the shelter. We were talking about client matters and didn't feel like getting up and shutting the conference room door. So we had the advocate's door cracked open to see if anyone was coming. While we were both deeply involved in the conversation, the advocate's door slammed shut. For those out there that might say, well, maybe some vibrations closed the door, here's why that's not possible here. The offices are in the basement of the shelter, and no matter how much you jump up and down or dance, that door doesn't move. Trust me, I tried after this instance. We tried our best to recreate what happened, but we could never make it work. As I've worked in the program throughout the years, other creepy things would happen, like someone grabbing my chair, an invisible force sitting at the edge of the advocate bed. It was a part-time sleeping position and the smell of rotten eggs around room three, where the client saw the ghost walk in. I started referring to the ghost as Sister Margaret. I ran into one of my old teachers who used to work at the school, which the nunnery was involved with, and asked her if she heard about anyone dying in the nunnery. She asked more about our experiences, and after much discussion, I was originally thinking she was going to laugh at the stories since she was always a scientific thinker and always had to have proof before she believed anything. However, after I finished relaying pretty much exactly what I just told you all, her face had a serious look to it. She talked about how no nun had died on the property and what we were experiencing wasn't a ghost. You have to make a copper omega symbol, blessed with holy oil, and place it facing north in the room. That will close the portal that must be in the shelter. A portal, huh? So that's exactly what I did. And ever since then, no client has talked about seeing ghosts. At least, not in that specific shelter. At our sister location, the house built back in the 1890s, there isn't an evil ghost, just someone who isn't ready to let go of their home yet. I'd picked up a shift at that location to help during the summer lull. Most of the advocates who worked there were college students at the nearby college and would go home for the summer. This is also a part-time sleeping position, which means once you lock up at midnight, you could sleep until 6 a.m., unless the hotline rang, which meant you have to get up and answer it. The sister location's office was located in what we called the day room. It was on the main level of the building and towards the front of the house. There were two main entrances to the room, which were two eight-foot-tall sliding original doors. One of the doors leads into the children's playroom, 
which is by the kitchen. The other leads to the foyer. So, to lock up, the advocates would padlock themselves in the room so no one could walk in while they were sleeping. As I was laying on the couch, listening to another episode of Bob's Burgers with my eyes closed, I heard the faint sounds of footsteps from the upstairs level, where the clients slept. Someone was making their way downstairs. It was soft and faint, like the sounds of a child's footsteps when they didn't want to get caught. I thought, it's probably just a kid getting a glass of water. However, instead of going towards the kitchen, these footsteps turned and walked into the playroom. They stopped outside the doors to the advocate's office. I lay there, wondering if they heard the show and thought I was on a hotline and suddenly thought they were being too noisy. Which happens. Wake up, wake up, wake up. I heard an old man's voice in my ear. I shot straight up with goosebumps forming all over my arms. Then a loud bang came from the door where the footsteps had stopped. It was like someone took both of their hands and hit the other side. With that, the shelter became quiet again. I got up and looked around the shelter. However, all the clients were in bed sleeping and the alarm was set, which meant no one could come or leave without us knowing. The next day, I stopped the shelter lead on my way out the door, and I asked, Hey, is this place haunted? She looked at me and laughed. Oh, did Walt visit you? Dumbfounded, I asked what she meant. Apparently, Walt lived in the house back when it was first built, and just never left. He had never hurt anyone, but he did love messing around with new advocates, especially overnight staff, by walking around, moving things, knocking on doors, or waking the advocates up. That's it for my shelter stories. If you or anyone you know needs help fleeing from a DV relationship, there is help out there. A Blue Blue Christmas from Mr. Mediocre it was past midnight on Christmas Eve. I was working at my local grocery store. I was cleaning the storage area, nothing out of the ordinary, just a mop and a bucket. This store was quite old, a relic of the 1950s. Few things had ever been updated here. The Christmas music ran on an unending loop, around and around. Strangely, we could change the music, but we couldn't shut it off. As I mopped the floor, the lights flickered and went out. I was surrounded by total darkness. The nearly 70-year-old speakers picked up their next song. It was I'll Have a Blue Christmas by Elvis. I felt around until I found the double doors that led back into the main store. I knew my friend Carl was just over in the next aisle, stocking shelves. I called out to him. Hey, Carl, man. You there? Nothing. Megan? Tim? I was shouting now. Still no response. The music kept on playing though. I checked my phone. No signal. Then I heard something. Something that sounded like it was being dragged over the floor. I felt along the aisle wall and moved forward. I called out. Hello? Who's there? The movement stopped. Then, something seemed to turn towards me. Every hair on my arm raised as I heard this ghastly, beastly thing around the corner. I threw down my mop, and I ran back into the storage room. I threw myself into the dry foods pantry, and I latched the door. The music went on as if nothing had happened. The lyrics singing, you'll be doing all right with your Christmas of white, but I'll have a blue, 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 blue Christmas. I stayed in the pantry for what felt like an hour. The lights flickered and came back on. I slowly peeked my head out of the pantry, but I saw nothing. I walked out and found my mop, which I'd thrown on the ground earlier. Nothing was missing, nothing out of place, no shelves disturbed. 
This was strange. I walked to the front of the store. There was no one here, no one in any of the aisles, until finally I saw the store manager, Craig. Craig looked at me puzzled. Michael, how did you get in here? Sir, I came in for my shift last night. He looked at me, still confused. Michael, it's 5 a.m. My heart sank. I ran over to the time clock. I was sure I'd clocked out of work at 11.30 p.m. the previous night. I went home then, and I never went back to work there. Buried in Vinyl from Minty Bow. When I was growing up, my grandparents would rent out these inflatable water slides to people, and I would help them to get some extra cash. It wasn't anything super complex or extravagant, just some simple slides with those ladder steps and the slide that leads into a small pool. So I thought it was simple work. Besides, I loved spending time with my papa, and most of the jobs went quite smoothly. But then there was this one. We had a customer that needed the slide set a certain way with the back end going down a slope. When we went to pick it up, the inside near the back end was filled with water that we couldn't reach with the vacuum from the outside. One of us had to go in, and what that really meant was I had to go in due to my papa's bad knee. It was simple. We'd open the flap, get the vacuum in, let it reinflate, then open the flap again for me to go in and start sucking out water. It was fine at first, but because of the heat, we had to keep the flap partially open so that I wouldn't bake alive. That meant as I was sucking out the water, the entire slide was slowly collapsing down around me. We would stop so I could get out occasionally and let it reinflate, but during every time those vinyl walls came down around me, I couldn't help but think about them trapping me in, alone, boiling alive, crushed into the remaining water in the slide. Just that thought alone made me start to hyperventilate. I had to get out of there all of a sudden, and lo and behold, that last exit was the one where the cord from the vacuum wrapped around my ankle. If I had been alone, or if we were any slower that day, that nightmare could have come true. We got the slide mostly drained, wrapped it up, and brought it home to clean. We made a new promise from then on, no one goes into the slide ever. A Haunted Grocery Store From A Pet Cat I have a story that, while it is quite sad in nature, it has uneased my mind for several years now. To my knowledge, everything contained here is true. The setting was a grocery store that I worked at for about a year. This location has since shut down due to theft, long-term electrical problems, and the company as a whole struggling with finances. Many grocers in my region struggle to keep profits, in relation, they also have issues with staffing, since they can't keep up with wages from other employers. Now, the story I have is actually in relation to this place being haunted. The building has what I call a watcher ghost. A watcher is neither loud, nor do they interact beyond misplacing items. In fact, they're often quite shy and will dissipate if given too much attention. Most of the people who claim to have seen this watcher are night staff. Personally, I only saw her once. She was over near the dairy section and was rather quick to dart out of my vision. I thought it was one of my co-workers, and at the time, I was looking for the night manager to let me out of the building. The apparition produced no noise. Of course, I looked to see where she could have gone to. Now, as to why I wasn't scared when this happened, I grew up near the woods. In a bit of a cliché, I in fact did grow up next to an old burial ground. The spirits there never did show me any harm. So with this little bit of information, I was more curious on who this ghost was. I do, however, have my suspicions. 
This is where the story became a little bit more tragic and gruesome. One night I had finished my shift, so I decided to go chat with M while waiting for the bus. M was in the middle of cleaning one of the long blades used to make cuts of meat. According to M, there's a story that gets told to every starting meat clerk there. Now, before I continue, I must give a huge warning that this story isn't for the faint-hearted. In fact, it involves someone deciding to put an end to themselves. So the story goes like this. There used to be this woman who worked as a meat cutter there. She wasn't exactly the best liked, but she did show up to work every day. The small details are a little bit fuzzy to me, since it's been a few years since I heard this story. I believe at the time of the incident, she had recently gone through a messy divorce. However, that's not what put the nail in the coffin for her. You see, this was during a period of time that the company had to cut down on labor, due to the growing recession. She was one of the many that didn't make the company's cut of trying to keep on their best employees. She pleaded with all the managers to keep her on board. If she couldn't keep her job or find a new one in time, she would lose her home, her livelihood. Well, it might seem heartless to some that her managers weren't able to find a way to keep her on, but you must understand the difficulties at the time. Many stores closed, unable to keep profits, Malls became ghost towns with vacant spots. Many people also lost their homes to foreclosure. It was an end to a golden age of consumerism. On the last day of her employment, the main character of this tragic tale decided there was no way she was going to recover. Faced with the prospect, with becoming homeless as the seasons changed to winter, she took her own life on the very saw M was cleaning that day. Now that woman's spirit, due to the horrific way of her death, had been imprinted on the old, now abandoned grocery store. Perhaps she has company now, as during the time I worked there, we also had a death in the parking lot. To close out this story, I want to mention that to those facing great hardship, there's always hope. Many government programs have gotten better over the years when it comes to immediate financial help, and the Suicide Prevention Helpline is there for when those thoughts begin to arise. Be careful talking ill of people in old photos. From AJ2023 At the time of this story, I was working for a large security company in Dublin, Ireland. I'd worked in commercial settings, usually large, nondescript buildings with people coming and going. Well-lit, busy, and the furthest you can imagine from a spooky place to work. I would spend my days reading books and entertaining myself as best I could. I was contacted by my supervisor and asked at short notice to cover a shift. As the location wasn't particularly far from me, I agreed to it. Now, the place I'd agreed to guard would have the moniker Castle, but realistically it was a very large old house that had been repurposed into the headquarters of a large company. The house, although in urban Dublin, was protected by large gates and a long driveway protected by trees. This house cannot be seen from any public pathways. Proof of this comes from myself as before my shift started, I never knew what the property looked like. It was a beautiful, bright Sunday morning. My alarm had gone off at 5.30, and it was time to get ready for my day ahead. I had a bit of a sore head that was self-inflicted in Dublin City the previous night after celebrating a win for my local team. Groggily, I got into my uniform, pondered ringing in sick, then jumped into a taxi, which would take me to the location of my day's shift. A short ride later, and I arrived at the gates, I pressed the buzzer on the gate, and the guy I was relieving opened up the large gates to let me in. It was a good five-minute walk through a somewhat oppressive tree-lined entrance to the security office. Although surrounded by bustling Dublin motorways and a large town, once through the gates, the sounds of the city disappeared. That was very eerie. The trees lining the road were old 
and almost seemed to lean in over you as you walked. The way the trees had grown out blocked out much of the natural light, giving the pathway to the house a very gloomy and depressing feel. And this was on a beautifully clear Dublin morning. The security office itself was a room in the house at the front entrance. It had a large window looking out towards the driveway. There were multiple screens that were covering the site CCTV. There was also a board with lights connected to movement sensors throughout the house and the gardens. These lights would light up if they detected any movement. There was a large old-style wooden door leading from the security office all the way to the main house and offices. The type you would imagine to be in old castles, wooden with big all steel bolts. The old security guard gave me a quick rundown of what was what, and a quick crash course on the procedures and duties expected during the shift. After that, he left. I was now alone for the next 12 hours. The first thing that struck me was the absolute silence. There were no sounds whatsoever. Usually in security cabins there would be a radio, but the old security guard had elected to take it home with him that day. I sat down and read the morning paper I'd brought in with me. After a while, boredom got the better of me, so I decided to have a walk around the house and the grounds. The place was perfectly kept. This wasn't your average scary place to be. It was well lit and airy. All the offices were upscale with top-class office furniture. It was immaculate. Walking along a hall as I left the kitchen... I noticed some old photos on the wall. They were from the late 1800s, and they were of, I would assume, the previous owners, set outside the house and other various locations on the land. There was one photo that really stood out, the photo of a very stern-looking lady. Her eyes in the photo were the type that burned into you. I cannot fully explain it, but I felt uncomfortable. She seemed so strict and was not very pleasant on the eye. The picture of this lady was taken beside an old Victorian bandstand in the garden. The bandstand was still there, as I could see it on my little exploration of the grounds, although now it was run down and showing its age. I decided to head to the kitchen to make myself a cup of tea. The kitchen was down in the basement. Walking down the stairs, you could tell that this part of the house was really old. The kitchen itself was new, and its chrome shined with the little sunshine making its way through a small window up high to my right. A brand new top-of-the-range kitchen that was surely used to provide the esteemed employees gourmet food during their working week. As I finished pouring the milk into my tea, an alarm went off in the office. A wee bit startled, it was the first sound I'd heard in hours. The motion sensor had gone off. It was showing movement in the yard outside the security office. There was nothing there. I put it down to maybe some of the local wildlife setting it off. For the next 30 minutes, I had multiple movement alarms. They weren't confined to any one area and seemed to just pop up randomly. Thankfully, they were all outside on the grounds and far away from my office. So, although it had unsettled me, the most logical explanation was that all the movement was made by animals outside. There was a stunning peacock freely wandering the grounds. Around this time, there seemed to be sounds coming from all over the house. Nothing like in-your-face sort of sounds, just low-key noises. A creak in the ceiling, something moving about all stuff that could possibly be explained away in a big, old house. But this house felt different. The silence was gone. Even though it was still sunny outside, the house was dark. It felt heavy. I felt like I was no longer alone. And the movement sensors, they were going off in areas I could see. And nothing was moving out there. Well, nothing that I could see. Feeling a bit scared, I decided to use the office phone and ring up as many people as I could to try to take my mind off the fact I was here alone, and I would be stuck here for a few hours yet. 
As it was a Sunday, I struggled to find a willing participant in my conversation hunt. Eventually, I got through to a friend of mine. We exchanged pleasantries, and he asked me how I was. I told him I was covering a shift in the old house. He told me he wasn't even aware this property existed, as it was in such an urban area. He was very surprised we never knew of its existence before. I then mentioned the pictures I'd seen, and how spooky it had made the place feel. Laughing, I told him of the picture of the stern lady. The words, and I can tell you she was no looker, had barely passed my lips before two motion sensors switched on. They were at two separate locations at the exact same time. One was located at the Victorian bandstand, the exact location where the old picture of the stern woman was taken. The other was directly behind the door leading from the security office into the main house, inches away from me. I told my disbelieving friend what just happened. Go away out of that! A common Dublin expression, which expresses doubt on one's claims. I ended the call and checked the CCTV. Nothing. I switched off the alarm and reset it. This time, only one went off. At the other side of the door, inches away from me. I would love to tell you I was brave enough to open the door and investigate, but I'm no horror movie hero. I went the opposite direction as fast as I could. For the next two hours, I stayed outside in the yard. I only entered the office to buzz my replacement in through the gates. I was only short of going down and carrying him up the road myself. I wanted to get out of this place as soon as possible. The old security guard rambled up the walkway as the summer's day was drawing to a close. He asked me how my day had gone and about any incidents. So I told him what had happened, how spooked I was. He chuckled, looked at me, and said with no hint of sarcasm or irony, <laughs> Now imagine what this place is like at night. He smiled, then turned and walked slowly into the security office. He took his radio out of his bag and turned it on, fairly loudly. Maybe he had it loud to kill all the silence, or worse, to drown out the noises of the night in that house. I headed off down the walkway at a much quicker pace than I'd walked that morning. I never again worked in that house, thankfully, and one thing I did learn that day was to never be rude about a person in an old photograph, just in case. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an eerie cast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com.